The painful story of lust and revenge involving Tamar and Absalom is one of the most tragic narratives told in the Bible. These events serve as warnings about the consequences of our choices and the company we keep. Few stories are as dramatic as that of Tamar and Absalom, sons of David, but from different mothers. Absalom, son of Maacah, and Amnon, son of Ahinoam, were half-brothers. Amnon had a burning desire for Tamar, his beautiful half-sister and Absalom's full sister. Amnon's passion for Tamar was so intense that it consumed him and drove him to illness. Tamar was a virgin, and Amnon found it impossible to get close to her. The plot unfolds with Absalom, who had a beautiful sister called Tamar, and Amnon, also David's son, falling in love with her. However, Amnon was unable to reach Tamar because she was a virgin, which led to a state of obsession and illness. However, Amnon counted on the cunning of his friend Jonadab, the son of Simea, David's brother. Jonadab, sensing Amnon's sadness, advised him to pretend to be ill and asked Tamar to prepare food for him so that he could eat it from her hands. This episode is described in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. Absalom, whose name means the peace of his father, and Amnon, which means faithful and stable, didn't live up to their names. Jonadab, through shrewd, gave Amnon disastrous advice, triggering a series of unfortunate events. Jonadab, Amnon's cousin, turned out to be a terrible counselor, as pointed out by biblical commentators, who described him as a carnal friend and spiritual enemy. Friends can lead to spiritual error, as was warned in Israel, and even close friends can offer false consolation and bad advice, like Job's friends, increasing his suffering and displeasing the Lord. As Paul teaches, do not be deceived. Evil talk corrupts good manners. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. If Absalom was Amnon's brother, then Tamar was clearly Amnon's sister. In his lust, Amnon didn't allow himself to call Tamar his sister, but Absalom's sister. The force of lust is so powerful that it can completely distort our perception of the world around us. Driven by lust, Amnon committed an evil act. Jonadab suggested to Amnon that he set up a fraudulent meeting with Tamar. They didn't need to explicitly mention force because in their shared wickedness, they both harbored the same perverse thoughts. Amnon pretended to be ill and, when the king visited him, asked Tamar to come and prepare food for him. David sent Tamar to Amnon's house where she prepared and served the food. However, Amnon refused to eat in the presence of everyone and asked Tamar to take the food to his room. When she entered with the food, Amnon grabbed her and demanded that she lie down with him. Tamar resisted, but was raped by Amnon. This event is detailed in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 6. A David apparently adopted a tolerant attitude towards his children, perhaps because he felt guilty about having too many wives, children, and responsibilities of state. As a result, he didn't devote enough time to being a real father to them. Amnon quickly followed Jonadab's malicious advice. Unfortunately, people don't always react in the same way when they receive divine advice. After his false friend's advice, Amnon's wickedness naturally revealed itself. Tamar, aware of the immorality and shame of the situation, resisted. However, Amnon, blinded by lust, failed to see what was obvious. The ambush was set up at the request of the royal family, and the innocent Tamar was taken to the room of her half-brother, who was supposedly ill. This episode is detailed in 2 Samuel chapters 13, verses 15 to 18 in the New American Standard Bible. After the act, Amnon began to harbor an intense hatred for Tamar, revealing that his feelings for her were of lust, not love. He was only interested in Tamar for what he could get from her. In many relationships based on lust, there is a mixture of love and desire. But in Amnon, only lust prevailed. His regret came from the fact that he had never really loved Tamar, but had only been motivated by lust. Tamar became a constant reminder of his own foolishness. Amnon wished away any reminder of his sin. Tamar, deserving of better treatment as an Israelite relative and sister, was treated with contempt by Amnon. This passage is in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 19 to 20. Tamar, in anguish, covered herself in ashes and tore her royal robes and burst into tears. 
Her brother Absalom consoled her and kept quiet about the incident, although he was already planning to take revenge on Amnon. David, furious, didn't punish Amnon as he should have, perhaps still dealing with his own previous sin. Aware of his responsibility, David felt unable to act. Intentional sin robs us of moral freedom and the ability to witness freely. This passage is in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 21 to 22. When David heard about all this, he was furious, but he didn't take any action against Amnon. Perhaps because he recognized himself as guilty in similar circumstances, and therefore felt he had no moral authority to reprimand his son. For two years, Absalom plotted his revenge against Amnon for what he had done to Tamar, using a cunning similar to that of Amnon. Absalom invited David to allow Amnon and all the king's sons to come to a feast, making David partly responsible for the gathering, just as Amnon had done. David allowed Tamar to visit Amnon with food during the feast, when he was merry with wine. Absalom then ordered his servants to kill Amnon in fulfillment of his revenge. This passage is in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 28 to 29. Absalom, the cunning executioner, waited for the opportune moment to act against Amnon, who had probably been looking forward to meeting Absalom, but had relaxed after drinking wine. At the right moment, Absalom ordered Amnon to be killed, and his plan was carried out resulting in Amnon's death as judgment for David's sin. God promised that the sword would never depart from David's house, as it says in 2 Samuel 12, 10, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house. God kept his promises. This episode is described in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 30 to 36. When David heard that all the king's sons had died, he was distraught. However, Jonadab, Simeah's son and David's brother, quickly informed him that only Amnon was dead, the victim of Absalom's revenge from the day he raped Tamar. Absalom fled, and David and all his servants wept deeply. David's reaction, more of mourning than disbelief, indicates that he may have known Absalom's potential for evil. Jonadab, perhaps seeking to win David's trust, brought the news that only Amnon had been killed. However, God knew that Jonadab had initiated the whole course of events with his malicious advice to Amnon. On hearing of Amnon's death, the heir to the throne, David, was devastated. David's failure to rebuke Amnon contributed to his death. If David had applied biblical correction according to Exodus 22, 16, 17 and Deuteronomy 22, 28, 29, Absalom would not have felt so free to administer his own brutal correction. Absalom fled to Taimai, son of Amihud, king of Geshur. He didn't seek a city of refuge because he was guilty, and cities of refuge were only meant to protect the innocent. Absalom chose to take refuge in Geshur because his mother was the daughter of the king there. This passage is in 2 Samuel chapter 13 verses 31 to 36. The Bible offers cautionary advice on choosing friends, for example. It advises against associating with quick-tempered people, as in Proverbs 22, 24 to 25. Chapters one and four of Proverbs warn us to avoid those who tempt us into error. We should refrain from associating with evildoers, regardless of the tempting rewards they may offer. Those whose feet run toward sin should be avoided at all costs. The path of righteousness is the only one that leads to friendship with God. Human relationships represent one of the greatest assets we have bringing joy, peace, inspiration, and strength in difficult times. However, if we are surrounded by the wrong people, they can become the source of our greatest pain and regrets. We need people, but it's crucial to think carefully before allowing different people access to our personal lives. This will determine whether we keep our current friends or leave them. However, this does not mean that these wrong friends are bad or wicked, but rather that not all of them are suitable to accompany us in fulfilling God's will. Some points to consider, the right company can energize and support you in difficult times. In times of difficulty, the right people will encourage you to pray, suggesting the divine thing to do, and will be by your side, praying to God in faith and believing that all will turn out well. When Peter and John faced persecution for preaching the gospel, they may have initially felt discouraged. However, when they returned to their group of friends, they felt invigorated to continue their work. 
In contrast, some people may abandon you or encourage you to do evil. One example is Job's wife, who became a negative influence by encouraging him to curse God and die. Job 2 9. A good friend will look after you and ensure that nothing bad happens. Jonathan exemplified this by defending and protecting David when he was in danger. 1 Samuel 20. On the other hand, someone like Judas, who betrayed Jesus as described in Luke 22 47 48, demonstrates how the wrong company can seek the destruction of a friend or brother. The right people will always offer advice that promotes good. An example is Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, who gave the perfect advice, bringing rest and order to the people in the desert. The wrong people will offer advice that leads us backwards or to destruction, exactly what the devil wants. Unfortunately, this was evident in the story of Amnon and his sister, where all the evil that followed was the result of the perverse advice of a wrong friend. The right people will always rejoice in your testimony of triumph. The truth is that the wrong people will be upset when God blesses you because they can't bear to receive good news, wishing all the best for themselves. Choose your friends carefully and be a true friend. Human beings were created to be relational, and friendships are an important part of our lives. We need friends, people with whom we share mutual affection, but not every friend will do. Having the right friends is essential, and discernment is needed. The right to use choose of their friends carefully. Proverbs 12, 26. In Scriptory, we see what a true friend should be. He shows love no matter what. Proverbs 17 to 17. Offers sincere advice that brings joy to the heart. Proverbs 27, 9. Rebukes when necessary, but with love. Proverbs 27, 5 to 6. Influences, encourages, and sharpens. Proverbs 27, 17. Avoids gossip, Proverbs 16, 28. Forgives and doesn't hold grudges, Proverbs 17, 9. Is loyal, Proverbs 18, 24. And helps in times of need, Ecclesiastes 4, 9, 12. Lord, in prayer, I thank you for this revelation about the importance of relationships in my life. I thank you for every right companion you have placed in my path and for the help they have been to me. Lord, please guide my steps and direct my feet to the right people those who fit perfectly into my journey through life. I ask you to keep the wrong people away from me so that they don't bring pain or set me back. Through your spirit, may I always be led to the right relationships. Also, help me to be a good friend to those around me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Do you want to hear more about the story of David and know where the sentence that led to this whole story originated? See more in this video we have on our channel. God bless you.